Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to the second day of the international conference supporting the social inclusion of children and young people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Once again, I would like to thank very much uh, Dr. Jude Ta from Stockholm University, the project leader that uh, has initiated this great event, and uh, the Research Council 25 for Language and Society of International Sociological Associations, as well as Polish Pedagogical Association, who is uh, supporting this conference. I would like to welcome all of our distinguished guests and speakers, and a particularly warm welcome comes to six uh, Ukrainian universities who has joined us today. We have some speakers uh, from these universities with us um, who will be uh, talking to us later. The plan is that we will start here and then we will move uh, for a coffee break at 11, then we come back and we will have parallel sessions. One session will be in this room and the other session will be in Building C at room 3088. After the second sessions, we will go for lunch at 13.30. Uh, you will receive a coupon uh, so that you can choose what you want from uh, the whole selection of the menu available in Bar Filmowe, in the film cafe that is on first floor of Building C. We will try to guide you there. We had a wonderful, generous dinner yesterday, thanks to uh, EU funding for the project, <laughs> removal of barriers to social inclusion. And now uh, I see that the last guests are coming, so welcome, welcome, thank you for coming. Um, I would like to introduce our keynote speaker for the morning. Uh, this is uh, Professor Dr. Esperat Barat from CEU, um, representing, I suppose, both Austria and Hungary in one. And uh, uh, she has received the UNESCO Janusz Korczak Chair Jubilee Medal yesterday, so I feel particularly privileged that she agreed to speak to us today. Uh, after that, we will have a presentation by Professor Błażej Kmieciak from the Maria Grzegorzewska University, and then uh, another address by Dr. Piotr Toczyski, also from our university, um, many of the mm, presentations have been already published in a book edited by Dr. Eva Dombrova in the UNESCO Chair Series, Acceptance, Participation, Solidarity. It is available on, in open access to save the planet and the trees uh, on the university website uh, and on the publisher's website and we'll be sharing a link with all of you after the conference. So once again, thank you so much for being here. And I would like to give the floor to Professor Dr. Esbarat Barat. Okay, so I'm not going to be standing all the time, but for a start, I would like to thank you, okay, and the University of Maria Grzegorzewska for the medal that I received totally unexpectedly, and I feel very humbled by that. So thank you very much. And I hope what I have to say now, to some extent at least, is going to live up to the recognition. So thank you very much. Okay. Now, some disclaimers at the beginning. First of all, you would uh, like to know that my field of scholarship research and teaching has got to do with gender studies and critical studies of discourse. And that means that uh, I'm interested in exploring the ideological investment of the meaning of different concepts on the one hand, and on the other hand, intersecting with it, most recently what I have been um, uh, focusing on in the context of the anti-gender politics all over Europe and I can say globally now is uh, how to understand transness. So I have designed a course on trans feminism and in that context what figures very uh, centrally is the understanding of embodiment.
So at the intersection of those two interests, I uh, was thrilled to be able to put together a talk. And in that one, what I would like to do partly unexpectedly in response to some of yesterday's concerns in the workshop at the end is uh, to reflect on the very concept of uh, disabledness. Okay, and I'm trying to provide a framework that would understand it as a matter of social practice and, and um, a matter of social form, uh, forms of social injustice. In other words, what I'm trying to present here in 15 minutes, okay, is like to, um, the, how to rename what we are dealing with, okay? So in that sense, at the highest level, speaking to philosophers, one could say that this is about the politics of naming. Okay, so. <clears throat> Above all, the event that I am going to use for analysis, okay, and attracted my attention for today's talk, is the French movie, Anatomy of a Fall, okay, which won the uh, Palm d'Or at the Cannes Festival last May. It has a, power, a powerful scene in it. The widowed wife, Sandra Voiter's defense, is challenged by the prosecution in the courtroom about the limited value of Daniel, her son's recollections of the events preceding the father's death, his fall, and this concern is voiced due to Daniel's blindness. The boy is sitting in the courtroom throughout the whole trial. So he is there at this moment as well. The mother is disturbed by the lawyer's assumption that we can only succeed in life by overcoming disability, which in her view is clearly not the case in Daniel's life. She immediately interrupts the lawyer to protest. She is underscoring that after the family car accident, she has made sure that Daniel would never think that he should be living an imperfect life as a visually impaired boy. She points out that his life is as valuable as any other kid's life of his age. He can play the piano, he can go on walks on the hillside with his guide dog, and he has grown into a confident teenager. The spectator will know that this is a crucial point for the mother, as at this point, she switches into English, breaking the court's expectation that she should speak French while on trial for killing the husband. Although I am suspicious of the director's use of code switching, as it is against the existing policies on providing court interpreters in Switzerland where the film is set, I understand that he opted for his unwarranted solution to index the and underscore this point in the film narrative. So, how to read the scene? And the, direct, and the director's decision beyond the normative discourse of disability. What does inclusivity mean here? There are a couple of important questions to ask when considering the mother's understanding of inclusivity. How could we foster a positive space in the face of rejection and hostility that is brought about the normalization of ability? How could we subvert the logic that links defects with the need for cure? Otherwise, we are leaving the body open to shame. I argue that for that move, we need to challenge the understanding that disability equals deficit and it is only naturally desirable to be cured. Where can we turn to find a logic that moves beyond the perspective of perfection? 
That is what the original, longer title of my talk actually formulates as what is at stake, how to grant personhood to all forms of embodied life beyond the routine ideology of ableism and its promise of overcoming. I think what the mother in Anatomy of a Fall challenges is the humanistic ideology of cure and the restructuration or resetting of social order. He protests, her protest articulates the perspective that Ellie Kerr in their 2017 book calls brilliant imperfection. I shall argue for three key elements to be subverted for a shift towards a favorable discourse of naming. I think imperfection then can be argued to be linked with Jasbir Pua's preference for the term creep bodies, creep lives, instead of disabled bodies. Pua's challenge is not only the fact that disability may evoke able bodies as inherently the preferred form of embodiment and more valuable form of life. In addition, she also points out that the naming is also a move that routinely devisibilizes maimed bodies, precisely because debility is profitable for neoliberal capitalism. The politics of neoliberal capitalism relies on technologies that necessitate effective dimensions of control as ways of undermining biopolitical agency. Pua's introduction of debility pushes us to rethink disability as a matter of social justice and not necessarily only reduced to a matter of medicalization. I am certainly not arguing in favor of an anti-cure politics on the whole. I am not arguing that one should not seek some bodily change and treatment. What I am arguing for is a different logic informing the ways we name those needs and desires as social requirements. In agreement with Ali Claire, a, tra a trans feminist scholar, I propose to deconstruct and challenge the assumptions of normal and natural evoked by the fetishization of cure that implicates certain bodily existence as disabled, imperfect, defected, and as such to be mended. So now the analysis of the scene in terms of redefinition of inclusivity, this social-oriented redefinition of inclusivity. I think the mother in the courtroom is resisting precisely the shame that is routinely reiterated by the prosecutor's judgment of her son's impaired vision that tries to medicalize Danielle's sense of identity. Her intervention shuts up the dominant logic that tries to get in the way of the boy's coming home to his body. More importantly, what is at stake in the protest, in the parents' success, success at understanding and passing on that understanding to their son, that his body is irrevocably different from how he used to be before the family car accident. We are not told anything or shown any flashbacks about the actual education that the parents took up after the accident. The spectator can assess those efforts through the self-confidence of the boy in the courtroom and through the upset of the mother. In fact, we, the viewers, are only made aware retrospectively how much effort that education must have meant. Up to this point, we are not reminded of Daniel's impaired vision through any diagnosis that could, that could trigger our sympathy 
precisely because both the film narrative and the visuality sidestep such disabling consequences. The inclusivity of the film consists in inviting us, the viewers, to tacitly understand that Daniel's bodily life is irrevocably different from others, but without associating this life, Daniel's life, with any of three possible interlocking stigmatizing moves of disability. So now here comes the three things that are not evoked by the filmmakers. One could be that there is a necessary sense of defect evoked. The problem with the element of defect is that it should, ironically, trivialize the emotional, intellectual, and bodily work it takes not to be caught in the logic of ableism. At the same time, it could deliver for the able-bodied gaze the understanding that Daniel's condition is that of medical disability. However, we could argue that his condition is that of social injustice. What mothers like Sandra Voiter and sons like Daniel need is rights and recognition, the, de the denaturalization of entitlements of the perfect bodily life and reconfiguring it as a matter of politics. As Elika powerfully puts it, quote, for me, having cerebral palsy is like having blue eyes and red hair. I simply do not know my body any other way." End of quote. The second dimension of entanglement of the association of disability with defect is body shame. Instead of the shortcut to some unwarranted promise of cure that can only indirectly invoke some bodily or intellectual wrongness, we should need to find ways of giving space for Daniel's own understanding of his feelings of grief, disgust, anger, or hatred, should they emerge. These are powerful or even overwhelming emotions, but lived in a space that is not inflicted by the routine naming that should invite a discourse of shame. The formation of such a space includes the decision if the people concerned are willing or able to be visible and exposed to some public scrutiny. We could therefore interpret the director's decision not to have any flashbacks about Daniel's life after the car accident as an act that grants that privacy that is not an option for the disabled body that is constantly exposed to the scrutiny of the medical gaze. Finally, the third element entangled in the meaning of defect disability is the idea of compulsory normalcy. We should try to disentangle the so-called disabled life forms from the sense of disorder by disassociating the diagnosis from non-ordinary, to allow for living one's disabled bodies as familiar and ordinary may subvert the power that the medical gaze may hold on them. The deconstruction of these three elements could allow for a disability politics that does not confine those concerned to a so-called disabled body. Now for a closure, I would rather like to open up a trajectory for further analysis, which I did not carry out today. Above all, because the film I have chosen does not problematize Puar's major concern about Crip nationalism. But it could be a valuable point for critical pedagogic research to consider how economic imperialism may drive on disability as a way of selecting and preparing bodies for economic production, manufacturing disabled bodies, as an effect of consolidating notions of normative embodiment. 
we could consider the role of disaster capitalism in creating and maintaining economies of disability, drawing on Puar, who makes a compelling point about how the social practice of debilitation is constitutive of neoliberal capitalism. This could invite a critique that exposes that inclusive pedagogy is marginalized today at the intersection of producing multicultural subjects and intense and at the intersection of intensified domestication of critical pedagogy in a society of post-democratic centralization of power, teacher training included. Against this dominant tendency, we need to try to interrogate the political to interrogate and integrate the political, the pedagogical, and research. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. That was very inspiring. Now I would like to ask Professor Błażej Kmieczek to join us and uh, take over. Um, let me see. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you very much for invitation for this great conference. I know that uh, my first name Boisre is quite difficult for you. <laughs> Not so difficult like Grzegorzewska, but but it's quite difficult. Uh, you can speak this in other way, blaze, bless, or in Italian, biaggio, like you prefer. This is a strange situation because quite young guy will talk about love. <laughs> yes, but for me, um, I am um, a special pedagogist and sociologist of law, and perspective of human rights is very, very close to me, and human rights of of people with uh, with disabilities and intellectual disabilities. Is very close to me because I am. Uh, I've got a younger sister with intellectual disability, and when I am talking with Mary, she's name is Mary. I'm sometimes thinking, what is what? What's she thinking about law? What's she think about love? About relationship? About uh, future? About some perspective of being close to other person? And uh, first of all, uh, my my plan of reflection will be, uh, what do we want to? Why why do we want to get married? I've got married when I was 21, and my friend from from study from he he said to me that I am insane person, that I need to go to psychiatry if I want to go to marry, to be a, 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 so so this was uh, I remember in church he he came to me and he said to me you are stupid, <laughs> so so this was a funny experience. Is there a right to marry? Do we have that kind of right? Can people with intellectual disability get married? And uh, this will be a reflection from our country or our beautiful country from Poland. Two reflections. Uh, first of all, this will be laughing therapy because I cannot speak in English. My, my grammar is horrible. And s I'm sorry for this. I will forget lots of words. My, my wife, she says to me, she says to me, don't use words that you don't understand. And <laughs> I'm going to use lots of words in this way. But second reflection is, this is my first time here, because I am professor of uh, Maria Grzegorzewska University since f February of this year, so this is my first time here. And this is a great honor for me, because persons like Dr. Janusz Korczak and Professor Grzegorzewska uh, are amazing for me and very close to me. So, so this is a few words of, of beginning. Well, marriage, that is an unusual and unique relationship, relationship between two persons. The person that feels something, uh, not only I like you, but I love you. We cannot define the love. I know that there are lots of people who want to define this word, but for, for all of us, these words mean different. Uh, for my wife, it's a it's, uh, it's very important word. And for my wife, for instance, it's important to be with her, close to her, and for me are very important words. Unusual and unique contact between two persons, we know about this. Um, 
consistent, con, uh, conscious decision is necessary. I need to know what I am doing, my friend. Like I told you, he was uh, he, he thought that I don't know what I have done. Okay, we've got this. And this is form of agreement. In, per, in legal perspective, this is form of legal agreement without an expiration date. I, I am husband with that uh, gold ring, not to 20, 25 on, or, or for next five or six years. No, I want to be a husband until the my, uh, until the my or, or my wife deaths. So this is unusual relationship. We know, I think, about this all. But uh, why do we want to have a husband or wife? This is a strange situation. I, I remember what I have, I have wrote. Why, why do we want to have that kind of person close to us, husband or wife? Why do we need some, somebody like husband or wife? Well, we do not want to be alone. Being alone is horrible feeling. Uh, I've got a friend, he's a priest, and he said to me one day, you see, the most difficult for me is to be alone. I am going home and I know that I'm going to be alone. And this is quite difficult for me. The relationship with another person gives us a straight, for me, give me also a hope. Uh, I'm going to, after the speak, speak uh, I'm going to uh, by the train to my home, I will talk with my wife about this. I will talk with her about funny situation, and this is important for me to talk with her about to talk with her about this element that is that is important for me. We need the support of somebody who knows us. It's amazing feeling that I've got close to me a person that I can tell she know what I am thinking. She know who I am and she can tell me concrete words that are important for me. Well, but can everybody get married? This is a slide, this is a photo from amazing Polish movie. It calls uh, Sonata. It's, this is history of a young boy with intellectual disability. It is an authentic story, he wanted to be a musician. Well, but he was, his name was Grzegorz, this is Grzegorz and Justyna. He was diagnosed with mind intellectual disability, significant hearing loss and suspected autism disorder. And this was concrete problem for him, but he wanted to be a musician. And he, I, I can tell you that this is a true story. He is a blues, blues musician. He, he, he's playing piano, great, great musician in Poland. But she, Justyna, she suffered from paranoid schizophrenia. She was a patient of psychiatric hospital. And there is a question. Can this couple get married in Poland? Well, I need to tell you that th this will be the problem because Article 12, I will read this from the Family and Guardianship Code. It, it said that a person suffering from mental illness, like for instance schizophrenia, and mental ret 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 uh, ret uh, retretion, I hate this word, cannot enter into marriage. Cannot. This is the norm. This is a ban. You cannot be a marriage, you cannot be a wife or husband if you've got mental illness or intellectual disability. However, this is uh, extraction, if the state of health of mind of such a person does not treat the marriage, treat the marriage or the health of future offspring, I can hear here some form of eugenic thinking, in my opinion. And if the person has not been completely incapacitated, the court may allow him to enter into a marriage. So the norm is you do not have a right. This couple here do not have right to get married. But there is a possibility to have a marriage with court acceptation and allowing. In uh, nearly 10 years ago, Polish Constitutional Tribunal found that Article 12 of this family code is consistent with the Polish constitution, mostly with the rule of the dignity. This was a strange situation for me because, in my opinion, this is a problem because I know a lot of people with intellectual problems, with also mental problems. I was nearly 10 years and psychiatric ombudsman in lots of 
uh, Polish uh, hospitals, psychiatric hospitals, and lots of people, lots of my patients, do not have, in fact, right to have wife or husband. But you see, Article 23 of Convention of the Rights of the Person with Disabilities, Disabilities says that states, parties shall take effect and appropriate measure to eliminate discrimination against persons with disabilities in all matters relating to the marriage, family, parenthood, and re relationship. We can see that we need to have an appropriate age to marry and frequently experience and full cons consent of the future spouses. So, international law, it says to us that all people, also people with intellectual disability, they have right to get married. There are also ele important elements that should be taken down, but this is general rule, general norm. You see, relative marriage of uh, relative marriage ban in Poland's Pol Polish constitutional law. Uh, lots of lawyers they are talking about that. This is what I am talking to you. The Article 12 of Family Code is in fact relative marriage ban. But th is this a legalization fear, or this is discrimination? Well, you see. What is the law of rate of? In my opinion, as a legal sociologist, I can read this, and I think that Polish law is afraid of marriage of people with intellectual disability. Why? Well, persons with intellectual disability can she give she or her give informed consent to marriage. This is a I, I know I, as a, a special pedagogist, I know that this could be a problem, but this is not the general problem. I will show you some some concrete cases of this. Does she or he understand whether there is uh, mother, ma uh, marital responsibility? In my opinion, I got a problem with understanding what is a responsibility in marriage sometimes. For me also, this is sometimes a problem. Well, next, can she or he make an informed decision about having children? This is a question for all of people, not only for people with intellectual disability. Well. Is organic thinking still present now? You see, I am a pers person with visual disability. I was born and for nearly five, six years, I was a blind person. And you can see, if you're close to me, that my eyes are moving slowly, but they are moving. And if maybe there is a possibility that I, I cannot have also a wife, maybe there is a freight that my daughters will also have a problem with, with, with vision, with seeing somebody. Maybe for, for my person, it should be also that kind of norm that will ban me a possibility to, to have a marriage. In Polish Article 12, we can see that kind of thinking, in my opinion. Well, discrimination or legitimization concern. Well, limiting the number of children with disabilities, no. This is the organic thinking. If you will go to the history of uh, Nazi Germany, there was that kind of thinking. The authority were afraid that they will born children with disability because people with intellectual disability love themselves. This is organic thinking, in my opinion. We are afraid that there will be an intellectual problem with children that will born children with intellectual disability. This is eugenic thinking, but informed concern question, yes, for me, this is the reasonable concern. We need to know what is the responsibility of marriage. We need to understand what is the acceptation to be a husband or a wife. This is important in the moment of getting married. Protection of people with intellectual disability from economic exploitation. Show me this here in Grzegorzka University, a few students that show me this perspective that they told me that there is a dangerous sometimes that there will be some form of economic abuse for people with intellectual disability. So the court needs to analyze the situation. Well, but you can see in, in, in the concrete cases, this is a case of Tommy and Mary and Pilling. You see the people with Down syndrome, 
probably within some intellectual problems with intellectual disability. But for me, these are beautiful person, amazing person. Unfortunately, uh, Tommy has died a few, a few years ago because of COVID-19. But you can see amazing relationship. And for me, this is the perspective that we need to, we need to see in, in global debate in Polish debate also about the possibility of having marriage with people with intellectual disability. Well, current regulation in Poland introduced an arbitrary ban on a marriage people with intellectual disability. Yes, there, there's, there is a possibility to, to have um, uh, some, some permission from, from, permission from, from, uh, from, from court. Court can allow us to, to, to have this marriage, but we can see the general ban of the situation. I think that this is not good information for lots of people. This, this is discrimination for people. It, it, you see, the, the problem, prohibition does not apply, for example, for people with addiction to alcohol. This is not a problem. You can be a person with problem with alcoholism, with addiction, and you can get married if you want. Okay, this is not a prob problem. Well, necessary change and concrete propos proposal, proposition, everyone, adult, has a right to marry. General concert results from the human dignity. I think that people with mental and intellectual disability, they need to know that they've got that, that form of rights, rights to love, also in formal way. Because having that kind of gold ring for lots of people is very important because this is a concrete message that I'm close to other person. This is a concrete, important message for them. When in case of justified doubts, they, that can be that kind of situation. I know this from my pra practice from psychiatric hospital. As to informed consent, for instance, marriage should be possible after obtaining court concert. I think that this is reasonable. This is, this is for me quite obvious. Well, the nearly last slide, this is uh, uh, Sader. Sader is a doctor of medicine. This young between this, the young guy between these two, two person. And this guy, uh, you see from, from left, is his father with Down syndrome. And on the right, there is his, his mother. They are married from lots of years. And he said, uh, in one interview, Sader said that relationship with his father was for him, also as a doctor, very important. He teach him that level, that form of empathy that cannot teach lots of professors, our students, I believe so. Well, I am legal sociologist, I'll tell you, and law we've got in our head. If we want to build some rules that respect human rights and human dignity, we need to imag imagination the situation of concrete group, of concrete person. What is the situation of concrete person with, for instance, intellectual disability? Then we need to put on our empathy. Empathy in legal reflection is quite important. And the next is action. A build concrete, uh, wise and friendly uh, rules of law. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Professor. I'm glad that you mentioned empathy. At 13.15, we expect uh, young researchers from the local college um, who will talk to us about their project, youth-led project on empathy. And now I would like to introduce to you Dr. Piotr Toczewski, uh, who will talk to us about Kochak and digital... Um, digital um, version of Kotchak. We need to use microphones so that... Uh, yeah. Good morning. It's my big pleasure to be here. After 10 years, I believe, because my first UNESCO <laughs> school and conference was uh, even more, 12 years ago. And uh, that was a remarkable experience. We were doing some Korczakian journalistic workshops there to the uh, participants. That was a very active today uh, event. And uh, actually, I could include this also as an intervention of which I will be talking. I will mention five other. Uh, the topic will be 
about uh, those interventions in Korczakian spirit if they have the potential of world change. Of course, I come here straight from the international humanitarian law lecture, and now I'm mm, quite pessimistic about any world change possibility at all, but uh, basically for the past two decades, from time to time, I was uh, investing in uh, positive digital interventions that uh, had this idealistic aim of changing something. It was usually action research or similar approach, uh, implementation science, and uh, those uh, PDI, positive digital interventions, they had some Korczakian spirit. I will mention one of them, European Youth Press, where people from 20 countries gathered together to publish together. It was uh, 20 years ago the year of European Union enlargement, and uh, this uh, institution exists uh, until today. So uh, there are some possibilities that uh, when you bring people together, uh, make uh, some analog and some digital experience for them, that it may last. Uh, so uh, that was number one. Is it Korczakian in any sense? It is, because youth press uh, refers almost directly to little review, and that's uh, what Korczak published uh, between 26 and 39. The last uh, issue was published in September and uh, it was uh, uh, disabled by, by war, of course. But uh, when you look into the archive of uh, Mały Przegląd, of Little Review, you will see a lot of youth empowerment through publishing. So that's a worthwhile case. And and uh, you can see this idea that which Korczak was uh, disseminating and spreading, that uh, there is no good press in the country where there is no good press for young people, and there uh, is no uh, actually other possibility to uh, get information skills than to practice those skills as a journalist. Uh, so Korczakian ideas, uh, uh, they were prophetic in a way to what uh, happened, to what was possible uh, in the years of uh, EU enlargement, let's say. I don't refer to the school press here, because school press is always very problematic. It uh, usually needs to be separated from institutions to make it uh, Korczakian. Uh, I will mention another intervention, Open Letter for European Day Against the Death Penalty, that's 2007. Polish government did not agree at that time to make this year the European Day uh, Against the Death Penalty, although it uh, used to be the World Day Against the Death Penalty. It's quite a uh, well-known uh, date, uh, 10th of uh, October. It's also incidentally the day of uh, mental health uh, awareness raising day. And uh, this uh, intervention, it was the open letter published by public intellectual, signed 1,000 times in her blog. The person was over 70 at that time. So that's interesting that, uh, uh, and the person actually referred to Korczak very often. She was the listener of Korczak on the radio when she was young. 1,000 signatures currently doesn't make a huge impression, but uh, move back uh, to 2007, blogs were there since four years, and uh, someone used blog, the space of comments, to make people sign petition to Polish government, and it worked uh, in a really uh, big uh, scale. And uh, some newspapers reprinted this letter, some other intellectuals joined, so uh, an interesting case. Uh, I mentioned here that the European Commission and Council of Europe uh, became involved despite Polish government veto. There was the meeting, the gathering around this open letter and uh, they joined this, uh, uh, not officially, let's say, uh, but they could uh, accept that someone is bringing the petition to them. So it was diplomatic, uh, but started in digital space. Then I will mention so-called Netochron. That's interesting, 2009, multi-stakeholder powered by CSR, Corporate Social Responsibility of one publisher. Currently we would name it um, Environmental, uh, Social and Governance because CSR is changing into ESG in this corporate language. But uh, anyway, that referred to uh, children's safety on the web. Uh, I was inside this corporate, I was working with them. They were not very enthusiastic. Uh, they have always uh, more important issues than, uh, than focusing on uh, children's safety. They want to sell advertisement uh, on the web uh, and so on. 
but uh, this uh, involved many stakeholders from NGO. It was the first report of this kind. We involved Public Opinion Research Center for it. We produced a lot of digital content uh, focused on internet safety, also security, also the language of the internet, and uh, produced a stakeholders toolbox. It's still available, you can find it under this name, Netochron, which actually some participants invented. It was not uh, our idea. Then uh, another intervention, this one is psychoeducational, inter interactive cognitive behavioral therapy named Typhoid Depression. Since two years we have it in Polish, it's in many languages, around 20 languages, it's available around the world. This one we are doing with uh, European Commission, it's the catalog of European Commission best practice. It's connected to alliances for public mental health, community-based interventions, but it's the digital part of the intervention. So I mentioned uh, four of them. And what is the extent of Korczakianism in this uh, kind of uh, interventions? It's uh, uh, in, uh, in its sense, it's uh, empowering youth, it refers to rights, it refers to civility, the language and safety, civility, and it uh, brings some clinical or subclinical interventions. So there are many aspects, many perspectives on what you can do with digital tools in the world where people tend to say that digital is uh, bad uh, without uh, arguing it in detail. So let's see the first intervention, youth empowerment, media literacy, and uh, information skills that's against lack of information and lack of uh, power. So uh, you empower youth with information skills, which are meta skills for the future, and you give them some power with it. The second intervention, that's about human and uh, funda fundamental rights and uh, freedom from, from death penalty. That's something that opposes uh, the mentality of, uh, of brutal solutions. Uh, civility of the internet, it opposes directly hate speech, intolerance, and uh, abuse, of course. Uh, those interventions, uh, they always needed to be self-directed on self-work and reflexivity. They had to have deeper backgrounds than just uh, some keywords. Uh, so usually they required uh, true work of community before deploying the intervention. Uh, intervention of this kind, it's not just, you know, sitting uh, by yourself uh, for five minutes and publishing something on the web. It requires uh, a lot of uh, effort around, a lot of people around this idea. So they connected two worlds, digital and non-digital world, even if they're positive digital intervention. And if I were about to uh, ask you to remember one lesson learned from all of them, it's that uh, digital is only tip of the iceberg. You need to work uh, really separately from digital world, but act in digital world uh, through, uh, through what you do out of it. So all of them contributed on, in a very small scale, because uh, I don't want to say that it uh, truly changed something uh, for longer, but it uh, contributed to raising meta skills in Polish society, in some EU participants, some Council of Europe participants of those activities. They strengthened the skills of uh, psychologists and educators, the gatekeepers uh, uh, in, uh, in many cases, especially the one focused on recognizing uh, hate speech and the one focused on uh, psychoeducational cognitive behavioral techniques. Uh, they raise awareness, they raise um, human rights approach, and uh, they raise the capability to refer to mental health specialized services. Uh, according to the interagency pyramid of uh, of uh, psychological interventions, MHPSS. They also foster some specific kinds of social prophylactics and build uh, the abolition mindset uh, in, uh, in certain instances. So they refer to something which we would call meta skills, not just for particular skills. And I would even suggest the name of SDG skills for them because they refer uh, to what uh, you know as sustainable development goals very often. When you look at this idealistic picture of what United Nations uh, is offering us currently and wo what we like to report uh, actually is uh, referring uh, a lot of uh, sustainable development uh, uh, <laughs> uh, agenda and uh, and uh, health promotion and disease prevention also is part uh, is part of it, especially non-communicating uh, diseases, which refer to mental health. That's specifically the goal number three, three point four, especially of uh, SDG agenda. 
So in one word, uh, those Korczakian interventions, they may uh, contribute to UN Millennium Goals and currently SDGs, Sustainable Development Goals, because Millennium Goals are no longer there, uh, but uh, they are pretty similar. Uh, we observed catalytic effects. Each accomplished intervention builds fundamentals for next, because pe pe people involved they are hungry of next intervention. So they, even if they don't truly change anything around, something changes in them that they want to get uh, uh, get engaged uh, in uh, in even more scale. So that's uh, how you can think about this kind of interventions. That changing large scale society may be not easy, but changing something deep inside uh, uh, the participants may also be what uh, you actually aim at when uh, designing this kind of activity. I mentioned also uh, one more intervention, uh, very briefly. This one is called Silver Digital Content. Uh, it was published uh, one year ago, or maybe one quarter ago, in a book in Polish. Uh, it started in 2007 uh, and uh, the second stage in 2012. It ended when the um, person who was uh, uh, the participant of it died. It, w it referred only to one person, one older person who published uh, over 100 texts a year on the blog, starting from 2012, another one, not the one that I mentioned uh, before. And uh, it required uh, um, the approach, the valuing of uh, intergenerational dialogue. So to start this intervention, uh, someone had to believe that it's uh, the value to discuss things between generations, like the person who is 80 plus wants to say something to people who are 20, 30, or in their 40s. Uh, basically, um, it required also the presence of so-called proxy user. So it's uh, useful for those who want to hear and read more of the content produced by older people. And uh, the connections and engagement uh, is, of course, uh, beyond the, the internet in this case. The person is blogging. But what's happening with the content? Uh, what are the circles of influence of this? Oh, <laughs> it's ended. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, the time uh, is clearly end ending, but <laughs> or maybe I spent too much time on this particular slide, but only five minutes. Uh, so basically, there is the book uh, which you can find uh, about this in Polish. You can find some articles in English. I will not focus on them very clearly. But uh, this intervention is uh, against uh, uh, the sent attachments idea, because uh, the idea of uh, involving uh, older people on the web is very often currently like, let's learn them how to do it themselves, how to send attachment. Um, actually, what we need to do is to make them participate, to get engaged into the activity, but not necessarily to learn how to change the wallpaper, send attachment, and I don't know, defragment, uh, hard drive. So uh, this participation focus uh, is uh, uh, something which, uh, which I would like to pay your attention to. In this case, it works to so-called uh, proxy users, the persons who understood that there is urgency to build sustainable connectivity for publishing wise soldiers people content. How much time I have? Is it after time already? Yeah. So uh, last sentence will be uh, referring to this uh, proxy usage. It's crucial. Uh, proxy usage uh, is, uh, is uh, crucial, and uh, and those conclusions open some theoretical uh, discussions, which uh, more or less connect us to the notion of liberation, liberating us from the constraints which are caused by uh, by what's happening around. Uh, so I will uh, omit uh, the next slides, but the theoretical approach to which I would like to uh, direct your attention with this uh, short speech is that uh, we need to search for such theoretical tools. They are already there, they are available. We don't have to reinvent them. We just have to uh, re read them, which allow us to uh, conduct this kind of uh, intervention, thinking about liberating uh, beneficiaries from the constraints and making them truly participants of, of the activities. So thanks a lot for this opportunity. Next 12 years, I hope I will be here more often. <laughs> Thank you, Piotr. Thank you very much, and I would like to uh, point your attention to projects that Piotr is doing, especially Fight Depression Project and special tools you can access online to diagnose uh, depression. So uh, if any one of you is interested in this project, please approach him during coffee break. <laughs>
and visit us uh, when you have free time in 3213. We are there with another UN agency. Uh, this one is uh, under the umbrella of UNESCO. We are with an international organization for migration. And uh, I can give you some materials about those sci-fi depression things. Thanks a lot. Okay, thank you very much once again. And I would like to announce three, uh, three presentations that uh, we await. Uh, the first one will be by Professor Agnieszka Naumiuk from University of Warsaw. Then we will uh, listen to uh, Olga Hurenko, Natalia Cybuliak and Olena Staryńska. And then finally, we will listen to Natalia Tsumarieva from Donetsk State University. So uh, please, uh, Professor. Thank you very much. Uh, I have a priv privilege and honor to be here as partner university of APS, uh, University of Warsaw, Faculty of Education. And um, I'm very glad to uh, show participants uh, some basic, some initial findings that we have. Um, we started a very interesting European project called Responsive, which is um, which targets at different possibilities or different services that uh, we see as important part of our helping professions, and uh, we decided to do it in consortium of three, of sorry, of six um, countries, uh, five universities uh, in Innsbruck, in Olberg, in Nanterre, uh, Warsaw, uh, Lisbon. And in Romania, the, Inter the uh, European Association of Social Workers. We are trying to build the network of people who, uh, who care about the change of social services. And so we decided to apply for the European project Horizon, the Future of Democracy and Civic Participation. We were surprised that our uh, plan won. Uh, one of the four projects uh, that only ours is connected with social services. The others are one, are one are more connected with policy making. So, um, and also it, our program is uh, different because we decided to have qualitative approach, which for us is very important to study experiences of different stakeholders, not to have big data, but to have human uh, address and human um, feeling uh, of what is, what is happening, what is right, what is wrong, how we together could change, and how uh, people, especially in vulnerable situations, could have more voice and more power and more participation in uh, in social services, which are meant for them. So the uh, decision was to take four groups, mental health, disability, child protection, and youth at risk, as a starting point. But we realized after, after a few months that it is intersectional uh, situation. We cannot divide into four groups. Many, in many cases, it is fluid uh, situation. So I'm going to present a few things uh, of the project and also the, f the first findings of uh, perspective of service users. So um, the main idea, the main question we had was about a responsive uh, approach, a responsive thinking, responsive attitude. How responsive are we in our social service offers? So, um, as, as a group of researchers, as a group of uh, um, um, practitioners, uh, we thought that there, there might be five key elements that we can integrate in our research and see and find what is going on there. So first of all, the normative, legal, policy. We heard today about the law, the importance of law in, in practice context at local, national, and EU levels because we also understand that services respond to these perspectives. They follow the rules. So how are these documents referring, reflecting, responsive, possibility of 
um, of those who will follow them. The second one was the um, branch inclusive, inclusivity operations and impact of official channels of citizens' input. So, so far, citizens uh, who are using services, are they included in advisory groups? Do they have consultation possibilities, complaints, evaluation mechanisms? We know that formally, uh, generally it exists, but how it is going to happen in reality? Is it really working or not? Um, the third thing is about goals, the approach, the public opinion, citizens who take actions, who are friends of the cause, but not necessarily uh, involved um, in full, and what is media saying, what is art production saying, then uh, what are the social service professionals seeing and what is their experience, what is their um, role in it, and then the, the fifth element will be to tailor, to co-design, to think about some innovations that citizens could feel and participate in, could feel it's theirs, it's, um, it's to, done together with, uh, with professionals, uh, citizens, uh, legal authorities and so on. And what is different according to current, um, current situations and current um, innovations. So we started, and this will be the, the um, my presentation will touch only the first two. Okay, I put them in, in green because we have done it, but I must say, it, they should be red, because what we found, it is a lot of gaps, it's a minimum of what we, we could do. So our target groups are in work package two, so it is about the, uh, the service user's perspective. Um, are people, mostly young people, and I'll be referring to this group here today, um, and their experiences of their childhood in situation of need or in situation of special need, with a situation of mental health problems, in situation of being in ch children's homes, foster care, lots of these things that may, uh, may happen through uh, someone's life, and what was their experience and how, uh, how they feel about these experiences? What was happening and how what is real? And we asked them to refer to the past five years. So it is not, you know, 20 years ago. So it was usually young target group, uh, 50, 17 plus, um, those who had some possibility and they didn't fe fear of telling us. Uh, so it was, was very intensive pro process of uh, empowering people to give the voice. They were afraid and I will uh, speak about it later. So our methodology was to look for responsiveness in social service field. What are the official documents, reports, policies saying and what are the what, what is data from interviews that we had um, one by one with uh, different people, different informants through interviews, uh, but also through workshops, through um, different uh, focus group uh, possibilities, but also we established so-called citizen boards. So we asked uh, service users to, to help us um, have proper language, have proper approach, have proper process, and proper data in the end. So we consulted them all over the process. It is participatory, of course. It is, um, it is important also for us. It was important to learn uh, the situation because uh, many of us, even if we have connection with services, it is not the situation that we know everything what is going on. So uh, this collaboration, this partnership meant a lot of us to, to us. So in short, because I know I don't have so much time uh, just to um, gain your your maybe attention, more curiosity, what are the, the findings that we had in the past six months only talking to service users in different places. I, I'm sorry I cannot refer to my colleagues in other universities because we are collecting data and we are going to have next, uh, after Easter, uh, we are going to have the seminar about the findings from different countries, so I can refer only to Poland. But what is the what are the findings? I know it's uh, a little bit simplifying, but social services in Poland 
based on service users' perspective are not too responsive. So, in general, it is um, it is difficult for for uh, especially for young people who are institutions who are under the care, uh, who have different problems, um, mental uh, health problems, uh, um, problems uh, with uh, health, uh, to um, to see services that are open to them. Uh, they are open to their participation, they are open to see their needs, even if they say they are, but the practice is they have uh, support given top down, they have the support that um, is, is the best and is nice and you take it or leave it. So co-creation and participation in services also in Poland is uh, uh, is in the process of learning how to do it. We uh, we have some uh, some difficulties in participatory approaches in social services. I'm not talking about everything, but uh, with that we have still the, the struggle. So the uh, it is about the the citizens' engagement in change of the services. It's not about you know the voice, but in change of the services. So empowering laws are still in minimum, so there is more focus in our current situation, I'm still saying, about on protection, on care, or market-oriented. So if you pay, you get better service. So there, there are different strategies that prevent uh, um, people in need uh, to talk about their needs, to talk about their real situations. And uh, there is um, many, many young people are saying that people had no time. There was the shortage of offer, uh, there is so shortage of time, there is shortage of stuff. So, and they say, frankly speaking, it's better than nothing. So we are glad that we have something. Um, current perspective, um, we saw, and even through the conversations with them, that there is imbalanced power relations. Still dominates top-down approach, vulnerable, group, vulnerable groups are dependent services service users, so they are afraid. They say, if I say something critical, will there be a punishment? Will something happen to me? So they needed a lot of protection and, and um, feeling safety. And uh, they understood they, uh, they were children under care, so others were taking decisions on, on their situation and protection and participation. So they said the only goodwill of some professionals and some new roles like so social assistance, we discuss it in Poland, so, uh, assistance of healing, were good signs, were stars for that. Uh, three new uh, aspects. W one thing, uh, we were flooded with lots of negative experiences. Um, People were saying not only about services, but also about the families in, from which they were coming, that they, they had personal crisis, they, they had oppressive institutions, and lack of understanding. Today we heard about loneliness. It's lonely situation when you have nobody to talk to, when you cannot say, you, you, you try to scream yourself. So, so that's, um, that's why sometimes they said, we had to drink, we had to do something to, to shout that we are there. So dysfunctional coping strategies, including so also social service trauma. We were shocked how, how much they were traumatized by many institutions they were going through and not getting help. So uh, some good people, but in, in general, uh, a lot of um, difficulties, complaints, but these complaints are not heard by the services because you know of this power and, and fear. So current participation is not existent. Uh, this fear of, of stigma, of self-stigmatization, fear of care, carers, angers, of losing service, of losing, you know, closing down the service even if we if we complain. So it's better to have the one that we we have. So and also lack of trust. Many young people were saying it doesn't met, 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 uh, it doesn't change anything. We they won't listen. They are adults. They they have their own strategies. 
And also, it was very interesting that we found out it is not news, but especially in, in experiences of these young people, it was very difficult to say, to see that there is 18 plus situation of transition gap, that uh, all vulnerable people still in need, but, but having shouted door when, when 18th birthday comes. So there is no um, phone call for, uh, for service for young children and, and youth because you are adult. So you need to go to different services, to different places. So they say when they, they, they transit this, this situation, they say there is no need to give feedback because I'm not an, any longer a child or young person. I need to struggle with my new battles and new services. So it was very um, important for us to know that also services for young children and, and, and youth are not getting feedback after situation is going uh, further. So what are the conclusions? And, um, and uh, I'm, I'm sure that uh, we all may have um, discussions on, on different aspects. And of course, these are not all the conclusions. And I would say that uh, at least the sixth one I was thinking when, when I came to this room, uh, the three, three of them uh, belong to general conclusions and three of them are strongly voiced by, uh, by our informants. The first one that we saw as uh, researchers and also as pedagogues, as, as um, people who are interested in change, is that um, there needs to be dialogue with dependent. How to make this dialogue of a person who doesn't see uh, himself or herself as in the same position? How to, we, we may say, okay, we have partnership with, but they know it is not true partnership. So how to make this, these functions of this dialogue, understanding, um, thinking that, that uh, we need to adapt to this situation. Also formal means of inclusion. So encouragement, uh, it is not, we cannot force people to speak, uh, but in many uh, situations, it, we he hear that, well, people don't care, they don't speak, they don't want to be engaged. It is not true what our youth and our former children said um, from the institutions. They said they, they need a lot of encouragement. They need a lot of, empowerment and not in words, in real everyday practice because they are afraid even to take the phone um, and, and call someone. So uh, it is a lot of, of, um, of that. So this is from service users. Learning to listen and react. We, we also need to do in processes that are needed to understand that for the st stakeholders' perspective, that maturity and, um, and feeling that we need to learn, that we accept feedback accordingly, and both sides, service users and service providers, it is helping all of us. Uh, the fourth one is adaptation and sensitivity to different ways of expression and different experiences. Um, it is easy to say, okay, I know 100 of service users. This is the 101, which is completely different. So, and the language we were talking today about the film, uh, that these people may have different experiences, but may use different language and we need to uh, understand each other. And uh, more human and less managerial approach, which is connected with empathy, with um, addressing the, the needs. Um, so uh, you can see in the, in the um, down some expressions of, of young people who are saying why and how they would like to be treated. What are the elements? And it's not about professionalism, as you can see. It is a lot about listening. It is a lot about understanding. It is a, a lot about um, fear that they need to have the platform for sharing and they need to have time to learn how to share. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay.
Now I would like to invite our friends uh, from Berdyansk State Pedagogical University in Ukraine. Do we need more chairs? No. Okay. Dear all, uh, I am really an honor to be there and present uh, the results of our study. And a little bit of information about our university. Uh, Bidan State Pedagogical University is one of the oldest university in the east of Ukraine. Um, but uh, since the first day of full-scale war in Ukraine, our city was occupied by Russian troops and since then our life is totally changed uh, and nevertheless we still uh, work and we believe that our country uh, is uh, win in this war uh, and uh, from April 2020 Two, our university was temporarily relocated uh, to Zaporizhia, is near the front line, uh, and we have a lot of challenging uh, how to work in this abnormal reality. Uh, and our experience is not only uh, about us, uh, around 20 universities in our country have the same situation. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, we are, uh, hope and believe that can do something really important for our students and our university community as well. Uh, so, as you can see, uh, a lot of university um, work uh, in um, difficult situation when we work in online format or hybrid format. For example, our university works uh, in online format totally. Uh, we realize a concept uh, university without walls, but it's not our decision, <laughs> as you understand. Uh, and uh, have uh, students and academic staff who still in occupied territory, uh, but they are Ukrainian uh, and so they are still with us, with, uh, uh, with their beliefs and minds. Uh, and um, now I want to share about the results of all Ukrainian uh, study uh, supported by National Fund of Research in Ukraine. And we try to uh, analyze and access the students' perception of inclusivity uh, by um, in. Ukrainian university, but today I want to share uh, the only part of this uh, study with focus on uh, perception students with war trauma. Uh, we understand that it's a new challenge uh, for Ukrainian. And the study about the war-related trauma among university students, particularly in war-affected regions, highlight the high prevalence of trauma exposed and PTSD symptoms, anxiety among students in this area. So we understand that it's our future and our reality now. Students who have experienced uh, war trauma bring uh, distinct special needs and perspectives into the university sitting. Oh, sorry. Come back. Mm -hmm. Uh, influencing their academic engagement, sense of belonging, and overall mental health. Uh, so uh, our uh, study is it was cross-sectional uh, analytic analytical study. Uh, we use um, 
survey online survey methodology to collect data from November to December 2023. The target population considered of students from various Ukrainian universities. Uh, and uh, um, the total number of our uh, uh, participants was uh, around uh, 4,000, uh, 40 uh, hundreds uh, and 36 students. And only um, 150 students uh, self-identify themselves as a group with war trauma experience. And it was really surprised for us um, because it's uh, modest percent, uh, persons. However, it reflects that current understanding of war trauma impact, which remains under conditions evaluation due to the war ongoing status and the delay onset of trauma manifestations. It probably underscores the complexities of accessing war trauma within academic settings, suggesting that perce uh, per perceptions and reported indicates of trauma may involve with changing uh, circumstances and over time. The initial dimension explored in this study uh, portrays uh, the inclusive culture within Ukrainian university, uh, these target groups, students with uh, war trauma. Uh, the findings reveal positive perception of the university efforts in creating a comfortable and safe learning environment, as well as acceptance of diversity. Uh, however, areas for improvement were identified in our research. Uh, the perception of barrier-free environments were low level indicated that some students still face physical, social, and psychological barriers. Additionally, material uh, assistance and respects between students, faculty, and management could be enhanced, suggesting a need for better communication and support for these target groups. The next dimension examined in our study focuses on inclusive policies. Notably, diverse programs and initiatives are well regarded, emphasizing that the importance in creating uh, inclusive learning environments for students. Active cooperation with students, governments, bodies is also highlighted indicating a strong institutional commitment uh, to inclusiveness and students' feedback. However, the uh, effectiveness of policies aimed to, at prevent uh, discrimination needs enhancement with only 18% strongly agreeing in, the, in this effectiveness. This call for clear communication and informants uh, of these policies, especially for students with war trauma, uh, who rally on secure and supportive, supportive environments this day. Additionally, while coordination between different support services uh, is reviewed positively, there is a need for more cohesive integration for academic support, mental health support services, and social inclusion initiatives to better support. The following dimension is addressing to the implementation of inclusive practices, uh, notably a strong culture of engagement and personalized support is evident with 48% of responses strongly agreeing uh, that academic staff actively engage all students and 52% uh, confirm their provision of target uh, guidelines. This is particularly beneficial for students uh, with uh, experiencing war trauma as it provides a sense of community, belonging and support. Adapting teaching and assessment methods uh, are also well regarded, facilitating a tailored approach to learning that accommodates the unique needs 
uh, of students uh, with war trauma. However, improvements are needed in the accessibility of learning materials. Uh, of course, a lot of students um, works with us only from online, and it, it is a challenge for all, not only for students, but for academic staff too. Uh, and uh, the customization of individual study plans. It is important too for students. Ensuring comprehensive accessibility and greater personalization in academic planning is essential for a generally inclusive learning environment during the war, especially for students with specific challenges uh, such as war trauma. So the findings uh, from this study presents a notably positive perception among students who self-identify with war trauma concerning the inclusivity of the university learning environment. A substantial majority of respondents uh, perceive their educational settings both comfortable and safe, underscoring their dedicated efforts by institution to cultivate a sense of belonging, supporting and security amidst uh, war condition. Uh, among the notable strengths identified in our study is a positive uh, pre application for adaptive teaching methods, uh, especially in online format. This is uh, adventurous for students affected by war trauma, offering their flexibility in learning approach to accommodate their distance circumstances and um, the possible interpretation in learning. Furthermore, the study highlights the critical role of individualized support services in such condition, uh, ranging for academic accommodation to mental health support. Uh, while uh, the findings from our study reflect positively on the inclusivity within university, they uh, concretely underscore areas as, uh, that necessity for the enhancement and probably our um, father re um, built and to build some different aspects. Um, for the first, uh, it's about uh, adopt trauma-informed educational practices. It is really important. It's, it's probably about our future uh, because we all understand that the amount of uh, such students will be increase. Uh, not decrease, unfortunately. So academic staff, supportive staff uh, need to know how to react in different situation uh, to different needs of this student. And probably not only about student uh, because staff is about a part of uh, university community. Uh, uh, second, uh, it's important to increase overall accessibility uh, in our case, it's about uh, digital accessibility for all students um, because we university without wall. <laughs> so um, uh, physical accessibility uh, it's not about it's not about us, but digital it's important and how to do it it's um, really c crucial. Uh, and uh, for rebuilding um, our um, society, not only university community, it's really important to cultivate an environment for empathy and understanding each other because we all have different experience in this war. And this war is ongoing and we don't know how to be and how to live. Um, for example, today in Ukraine was a massive attack, bombing attack, and when different staff, uh, students um, stay in different city, uh, sometimes in different countries, we uh, need to understand and to be empathy for each other because we are community that want to win in this war. So thank you very much, very much for your attention. <coughs> 
Thank you so much. Okay, this was very moving. We have one more presentation before coffee break. Uh, I would like to invite to the floor uh, Professor Natalia Tsumarieva uh, from the Donetsk State University of Internal Affairs, also from Ukraine. Thank you for being here with us. And um, after the coffee break, we will return here for the English parallel session, and the session in Polish will take place in a different room, 3088 in Building C. Uh, okay. Uh, good day, dear participation of the conference. I am Natalia Tsumareva, Associate Professor of the Department of Social and Humanitarian Faculty No. 1, Donetsk State University of Internal Affairs, Candidate of Psychology Science. Let me present to your attentive a report with a presentation on the topic conceptual approaches um, to the implementation of uh, barriers free access uh, to higher education for students with disabilities at the Donetsk State University of Internal Affairs. Uh, I would like uh, to note um, that our university is one of the largest Polish university in Ukraine with the beginning at the war uh, in uh, 2014. Uh, he was uh, forced uh, to uh, relocation three, time, three times, uh, first from Donetsk to Mariupol, then to Krivirih, and then in May uh, 2022 to Kropivnitsky. The central building of the university in Donetsk came under artillery uh, fire and burned it down completely. All other premises, educational building, special uh, lights, uh, classrooms, and um, dormitory were also uh, destroyed as a result of Russian aggression. Uh, not a single room so white. Un unfortunately, um, the entire material and technical base of the university could not be transported, uh, but the most important think uh, it is uh, all kids and students continued their studies. We have uh, retained 90% um, of the total number of employees and only about 10% are local workers. Um, in uh, 2023, organization and uh, personal change uh, took place at the university. Uh, it uh, included um, the Lugansk Education of Scientific U Institute named after Didorinka. Uh, despite uh, the difficult times, last year um, admission uh, campaign uh, was almost uh, the most successful in the entire history of the educational institution. Uh, we train specialists for uh, pre-trail uh, investigation, bodies, criminal police uh, unites the uh, preventive activities uh, on the national police of Ukraine. In addition, the university trains a specialist in the areas of law, uh, law in enforcement, economics, public management and administration and legal psychology. Uh, in Ukraine, there is a trend uh, that every year in um, increasing number of people with special education need seek uh, to obtain higher education. Because of the war, uh, many young people are traumatization, uh, both mentally and physically. Uh, 
Uh, that is why we strive for every higher education student uh, at our uh, university to have equal rights and opportunities in access to education. The integration of young people with special needs into educational environment, but um, also um, into societally helps uh, them acquire professional knowledge, uh, get a profession, self-realization, achieve a success in life and further career and feel like a full fleetly get numbers society. The main conceptual approaches uh, to the introduction uh, of barrier-free access uh, to higher education for students with disabilities are outlined uh, on the procedure for accompanied proved assistance to personal with disabilities and other less mobile population group of the Donetsk State University in internal affairs, uh, which the development is compliance uh, with the order of the Cabinet of Ministers of Ukraine uh, on the approval of the national strategy uh, for the creation of the barrier-free space in Ukraine for the period until 2030. Law of uh, Ukraine of Higher Education. Um, the purpose of the, this order uh, is to create a condition uh, for ensuring the rights and opportunities of personnel uh, with disabilities and other groups with limited mobility in an equal footing uh, with other citizens, inclusion are heeded, uh, access to university faculties, conversation and uh, comfort of their stay on the territory. The creation of the uh, inclusive education uh, environment and the Donetsk State University uh, of Internal Affairs includes uh, not only a free architectural education communication space in which students with disabilities uh, can safely move, study and communicate, but also methods and technologies of a joint learning with other students of education using a personal oriented uh, approach. Uh, thus, in order uh, to provide support, uh, persons with disabilities and other group of the population with limited mobility press, the button to the call the staff and the entrance uh, to the university building. At the entrance, uh, the lobby, the RAM uh, is a permanent post of the staff of the education institution with a necessary uh, provides information to persons with disabilities in other group uh, of the population with limited mobility and a component uh, with them moving in the educational building and in the courted area. Uh, persons uh, with disabilities and other group of the population with limited mobility enjoy them <sighs> Probably right when uh, aligned to the structural uh, angles of the university. For communicable uh, study at the university, applicants uh, have the right to the use individual technical means uh, in part um, particular uh, hearing aids laptop. Uh, to ensure the educational process of uh, applicants, the Moodle distance learning platform and other electronics means uh, can be used on which a set of education materials for the educational components and educational programs is pleasured. And today, for example, we not have uh, electrical in some city, for example, our city, uh, so students uh, can um, every minute uh, come to this Moodle program and learn themselves. Um, for the organization uh, of independent work, applications are given access to the electronic 
researches of the university library. For applicants with mobility problems, the educational process is organized in educational faculties with barrier-free access. Uh, the architectural barrier uh, freeness of the internal and internal uh, space of the university is gradually ensured token uh, into account the um, financial capabilities of the university and the technical capabilities of the architectural adoption and proofs for the placement of the uh, tessel refice floor um, tires along the passages. Constructions of ramps, elimination of th uh, three holds, institution of the special um, hand rails along the steps, ensure the proper width of door, passengers between tables, creation of proper sanitary uh, conditions and equipment of sanitary units in order uh, to ensure the uh, conjunction education of higher education students um, in accordance uh, with the regulations of the current uh, legislation of the university has equipped temporarily uh, shelters for a complex, uh, comfortable uh, stay of them during a muscle threat. Some of them are equipped uh, with elevators. Uh, Zara is also a group of psychological and pedagogical support for students with a uh, implemented um, in the form of individual consultation, training, and relaxation classes by university psychologists. Так, law in, uh, enforcement agencies play a key role uh, in mounting standards. They ensure the safety and protection of every citizen, regardless of their nationality, gender, age, religion, or uh, physical ability. University constantly holds conference, roads tables, uh, trainings uh, of the implementation of European standards of the anti-discrimination legislation of Ukraine, protection of uh, diversity and tolerance, successful communication with persons with disabilities and complex validations. Currently, many defines of uh, returns from the front and unfortunately, some of them are the ones who need the service of inclusive driving schools due to the correspondent injuries during military operation. Uh, as part of the uh, First Lady of Ukraine, Olena Zelenska, without barriers, the only driving school for people with disabilities in the Kirovograd region was opened on the basis of the Donetsk State University of Internal Affairs, inclusive facilities and special education program adapted uh, to the needs of people with disabilities have been developed for students. We only uh, have only one this school in our region. So, the peculiarity of study students with disabilities uh, in an integrated team is them perceiving them as equals. The sum regulations meant and place it of them by the university as uh, on other student. In an integrated group, it is uh, impossible to slow down the pace of the lecture, reduce the number of pairs and their duration simply 
of uh, reduce of the volume of educational material because this reduce the quality of professional training. Um, therefore, uh, it is possible to compensate uh, for functional limited uh, of um, affect the quality of education of students with disabilities and uh, provide the necessary support uh, uh, only by uh, implementing conceptual approach uh, to the implementation of barrier-free access to higher education in university setting. Uh, we have determined the following priority direction uh, for the fu future implementation of inclusion of Donetsk State University of Internal Affairs. The use in the education process uh, of the most accessible uh, methods and methods of communication for students of open education, including Ukrainian sync language, relief dotted front braille, adaptive text, and exams with the involvement of uh, relevant specialty and pedagogical workers. Development of individual study plans of students taking into account the recommendation of the individual uh, rehabilitation program of the conceptual of the uh, psychology and pedagogical assessment of development. Creation uh, of our electronic audio and video textbooks and training aids. Search uh, for the implementation of new models of inclusive education based on best global experience. Thank you for your attentive. Thank you. So just a few practical announcements. Uh, we have a coffee break now for about 10-15 minutes and after that please return here if you are coming to the English language section and if you're going to the Polish language section please go to building C to room number 3088 and here's Professor Perkowska Kleiman who is chairing the Polish section. Sekcja po polsku z panią profesor Perkowską Kleiman. Najpierw przerwa kawowa. Zapraszamy. Yes. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for coming back. Um, I would like to introduce to you uh, our uh, researcher, Dr. Ewa Dąbrowa, our Maria Grzegorzewska University student, Maria. <laughs> and we also have with us a group of very talented young people, young researchers, who are taking part in a UNESCO project uh, from a UNESCO chair in Pennsylvania. So I will just leave it to you to present the work. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you, Professor. Uh, it's a great honor to be uh, here and to be together with young researchers as well, because it was the special time, uh, very inspired for us, uh, and I think also inspired for young people. Uh, this uh, program is. Um, coordinated by Jameson Malcolm from the Penn State University, uh, but it's in cooperation with other countries, uh, with Hanover in Germany and with Galway in England. So it's multi-site uh, program uh, in Ireland, sorry, <laughs> but on the website, it's in England, I don't know why, this is the question, so we should write it correct. <laughs> um, and uh, this uh, program is special because I try to involve young people and to uh, give the opportunity uh, to make stronger some competences, in particular in science field. Uh, so maybe Maria, you want to say something more about the project? Okay, so it lasted a few months, so it was a long time for us, I guess. And 
I guess we learn a lot, and also the FP, the FP people we work with also learn a lot. They will show you some um, some data, some film about the work, um, and they will tell you some more. I think it was, I can say, a hard time, and a hard time in the best possible way, because, you know, it was a lot of learning, a lot of things to do, a lot of stuff, and um, I guess it was their maybe first time when they did anything like that, uh, but it was also the first time for me, so <laughs> I was also uh, like a young person with young people. It was very inspiring and very um, time which showed me how it can be really inspiring to work with people who look at the world in a different way because they are still younger than me. And I think that they will tell you the best about the project. Yeah, we have participants uh, from Ukraine, so uh, refugees from Ukraine, and one person in this program was uh, from Belarus uh, as well. Uh, and I hope you can share right now your experiences and tell something more about the program. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, very appreciate to be here with you because it's our very first uh, big experience to submit uh, to lots of people. Um, all of us uh, have been preparing the big project about really um, important problems in Ukraine. Uh, and um, these topics touch us every day. And uh, we will be pleasure uh, to submit them uh, in more detail. Unfortunately, a couple of people uh, aren't here, but they took part uh, in this project. So uh, we really appreciate them for, for the help. And I think we can start. В бегом року зачалиśmy реалізовувати проект Молоді Бадачі. По душі дискусії повстали два заспови, які працювали над дружними тематами. Перший заспов займався розвоєм заводовим молодіжі, а другий корупцією в Україні. Запрошуємо до участі у нашому проєкті, де даємо голос людям з різних заводів, щоб оповіли про своє досвідчення в заводах. Чесно ж ми кажемо, навчителям, інженерам, артистам, вживши ставичам і нього заводу, хотіли ми услышати твого історію. Поділіться з нами за рівно позитивними, як і негативними сторонами своєї праці. Нех і ні довезу ще, що справді ж твоя праця є виняткова, але також сум її визнання. Може твоє досвідчення бенжі інспірацією для когось іншого? Неважливо, як далеко є стачимо своєю кар'єрою заводовою, Твоя історія є сцена, є ще з нами свого дороги до сукцесу, трудностями, з трими ще споткавиш, і радощами для тих, хто до піра зачинив свого заводову подруж. Це чи мотивує? Піньонзе, пасія, стабілізація. Які саме бар'єри в розвоз заводовань? Брак в'єдзи, як то що нонш, брак спарча. Це потребує, щоб ще розвивати заводову, пущна студія, Większość uczniów liceum wybrało profil kształcenia zgodny ze swoimi zainteresowaniami. Uczniowie mają różne zainteresowanie. Najczęściej jest to sport lub czytanie książek. W rozwoju zawodowym uczniowie są wspierani w nikłym stopniu. Większość wskazuje, że nie otrzymuje takiego wsparcia. O wspieraniu uczniów największą rolę odgrywają inne znane osoby, np. przyjaciele lub rodzice. Może czas, by coś tu zmienić? Wprowadzenie większej różnorodności kółek zainteresowań w szkołach może przynieść liczne korzyści. Takie zajęcia mogą rozwijać pasję uczniów, ucząc ich nowych umiejętności i kreatywnego myślenia. Dodatkowo, kółka zainteresowań mogą być platformą do budowania społeczności, integrując uczniów o podobnych zainteresowaniach. W tym projekcie mnie bardzo zaskoczyło to, że szkoła nie bardzo wspiera uczniów w rozwoju zawodowym i ten fakt, że uczniowie po prostu nie wiedzą, kim chcą być w przyszłości.
Корупція За останні декілька років тема боротьби з корупцією в Україні стала майже головною. На цю тему сьогодні розмовляють усі. Тому цілями нашого проекту було дізнатися, що таке корупція, як різні випові групи відносяться до неї та як її подолати. Корупція – це незаконне використання прав та вповноважень для особистого збагачення. Більшість з опитаних нами кореспондентів відмовляється говорити на тему корупції, абстрагуються від неї і перекладають всю відповідальність на таємничих політиків. Попри все, кожен з нас щоденно є свідком корупції. Але ця проблема є, вона існує і ми маємо її вирішувати. Вивчаючи цю тему і опитуючи людей різного віку з Польщі та України, ми з'ясували, що 91,3% з опитаних вважають корупцію насправді великою проблемою. Все ж, за останні 7-8 років в законодавстві України відбулися і продовжують відбуватися суттєві зміни, які направлені на зниження рівня побутової корупції. З них – діджиталізація багатьох процесів, а також введення нових регулюючих органів. Звісно, подолати корупцію повністю неможливо. Багато людей, які висловились на рахунок цієї теми, не дали чіткого вирішення цієї проблеми. Аналізуючи, ми знайшли тільки одне рішення, яке може предприйняти кожен українець. Це не мовчати і не соромитись обговорювати тему корупції, бо тільки мовчання дає привід її розвитку. Нашими проблемами подавчині були е, такі питання, як як респонденти постачають корупцію, для чого існує корупція, що може нам дати старше покоління вивальця з корупцією і як можемо звальчити корупцію. В наших анкетах брало участь 24 особи. Запитаючи, чи вважають люди корупцію за проблем. З вивіаду дивичилися, що всі респонденти відповідали, що вважають корупцію за проблем, а з анкет 91% людей відповідали, що так, а осім – що ні. Коли брали вивіади, то Трохи трудним було одна лише ключі, а не в тих ключі, що я брав вам вигляди. Направді, чекав він було теж. Всі відповіді були дуже різні і не подобні один на друге. Я з тим дуже задовольнена, що мав змогу брати участь в цьому проєкті. Повім ще, що навчаю ще працювати в групі. Я з тим дуже щаслива, що довідала ще більше ще у своєму краю. Була вже скучена в тим, що старше покоління попирає корупцію. Вони, як оказалося, просто не мають іншого вибору. Труднощами для мене було те, що люди не хотіли йти на контакт. Вони просто боялися ще до тієї пори повідомити о таких витаженнях. That is the first presentation, that was the first presentation of this film. So I'd like to invite uh, Nikita and Anastasia. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much for your attention. Uh, in conclusion, I'd like to mention that we wanted to concentrate uh, all, most of our data on uh, answers of people that we interviewed. And most of them were our relatives and um, our um, people in our age. So, yeah, thank you so much. We are open for your question if there are any. Um, yeah, you have a question. I think that's some wonderful, you know, like project and you did it. So congratulations. So um, I'm curious, what is, why you, you pick this topic into your uh, project? Uh, what's the reason? Um, and also um, what's the, the most challenging that you, 
you face like uh, become a uh, young researcher yeah thank you uh, so I personally was uh, we divided um, our whole group to few groups so I personally was a part of corruption uh, project and I chose this topic because uh, for me it was something personal and I wanted to know more about this uh, social phenomenon and I wanted to I and the, the group uh, wanted to ask uh, our relatives the, the people uh, the strangers uh, how do they think we can overcome it and uh, what are why is it a problem today? Um, but I, I also like to introduce, uh, like I, I also like to uh, ask uh, for someone from other group if they want to say something, they can they can come here and say. And also, um, why we uh, why did we touch the uh, topic of corruption? It's uh, the biggest problem. I think it's the biggest problem in Ukraine and um, a lot of people uh, talk now about this problem. How we can uh, um, see the... Um, how we can solve this problem uh, and uh, other questions. And, uh, well, and what about the biggest... Um, obstacle uh, for our research uh, it was pretty interesting to interview people about corruption because they they don't really want to talk about it it is something forbidden uh, for them so uh, they started to um, mention some politics some uh, this high level but the, the corruption as I understand it is something that we meet every day in hospitals and schools and other uh, government institutions one more. Do you want to be a researcher uh, uh, as your career when you're, yeah? Um, for me personally, it was a very uh, interesting experience. Uh, it was fascinating. And I, and I think that in the future, um, we can develop this, uh, this process and uh, to have other researches more uh, for any topic. Yeah, I, I liked it and I think that in the future, I will, uh, I will do some more. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Uh, so my question is, and first off, thank you so much for presenting on corruption because I come from a country where corruption is endemic, where it's also like just an everyday part of existence. So my question is, I mean, where do you think it comes from? What drives corruption in Ukraine? What makes it such an everyday phenomenon? And I understand if there are like if you have to answer by guessing in places because you don't yet have enough data um, but I have to ask because it's something that I confront and I sometimes have to try and figure this out myself and I'd love to hear your opinion yeah yeah we um, we had a data that eight percent approximately eight percent of uh, people we interviewed they said that uh, corruption is something mundane and uh, it is part of their uh, everyday life and for uh, most cases it was um, like this old uh, people because they, uh, they 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 think that it is sometimes a lot easier to uh, be a part of corruption than than lose their time and and for for them it is something that they are engaged from the childhood so it is something normal and uh, it is totally okay to uh, i don't know to give money or some presents to doctors for example uh, for them because um, b because it's just a, a tradition somehow it's, it's just me mentality maybe uh, yeah also uh, a lot of students in our high school or uh, medium school uh, thinks that uh, they don't need to study because in the future they will give money for um, to be um, uh, headmaster of uh, school or university and uh, they will um, they will get uh, a certificate, and that's all. Um, it because um, it's one reason because it's the biggest problem in Ukraine. Uh, thank you very much for your research, and I have one question: Does situation change during the war, or not? Yeah. Um, so, 
we didn't really want to talk about this global uh, global corruption because we didn't have an opportunity to ask uh, the people that are uh, involved in this uh, process. And I know that today, um, due to the circumstances in Ukraine, due to all of these atrocities, uh, some people like um, um, they, they get millions of dollars. But what we wanted to um, research is this everyday uh, corruption, as I said before, because uh, it is where everyone, most most of the people have have experience. So we can uh, we can ask them uh, and base it on something real. Yeah. Um, yes, yes, yes. We uh, mentioned it in film also that for uh, last uh, like seven, eight years, which was interesting for me, some changes were occurred, uh, such as dig digitalization of some processes, this uh, this apps, and uh, now people uh, refuse uh, the amount uh, of uh, politics that are needed to solve some uh, problems. And what about this uh, high level? I understand that it's uh, increasing uh, every day, um, and we have to solve it. Uh, and it is our It is also our responsibility. Um, but during the research, we uh, wasn't able to uh, get some uh, information because the topic is uh, too uh, difficult to, to to manage to to, to manage to say it. Um, but yeah, we understand that it is a big problem. Sorry, I would just like you to say more about these apps. Yeah, uh, yeah, because of course. Th yes. That I'm not familiar with. Thank you. Um, so in 2015, uh, the, um, the new um, laws that were introduced uh, f first of all, uh, some institutions were made, for example, this uh, anti-corruption uh, court in Ukraine, uh, which concentrates only on corruption issues and uh, judges it. And what about digitalization? Uh, it is the app called DIA, and um, you, can, uh, you can do a lot of uh, this documents work, work with documents. Uh, for example, if you want to open your business, uh, you can use uh, this app and you don't don't have to communicate with uh, this like three or four people uh, how it was in the f in, in the past and that's how uh, the, this uh, primary um, domestic level of corruption may may uh, decrease i guess yeah i hope i answer your question Thank you very much. That's actually fascinating that uh, you are such young people and you're receiving such serious questions uh, at this moment. Congratulations first uh, for, for your work. My question would be about the first part because corruption is very emotional and hot topic for all. But um, I have two questions. One question is about the process. What uh, your group, uh, what do you like the most about your research? The planning part, the, the actual process of study, then maybe the discussion, the finalizing. What, uh, what is your experience? What did you like the most? And uh, the second question is, uh, uh, the first study was about uh, support uh, for young people, for high school children. Um, what uh, did you manage to change in your school uh, about professional orientation, professional support for, uh, for your school? Uh, so I can answer the first question, but for the second, um, I will ask to uh, someone from the second group uh, come here. And uh, for the first question, it was we had different roles in uh, this project. So I, I, I the, the part that I really liked is uh, making film because this compilation, this combination of uh, facts that we and uh, all of the material that we get uh, got is. The, the most fascinating part for me, uh, but also the interview part was um, something specific because it, it, you you see how people try to avoid your questions and they they don't really want to answer and you try to make um, 
make them to answer directly uh, that you asked, and it was really interesting, and uh, I, I didn't even think that some researchers missed problems like this. Uh, for me, it's like um, uh, opportunity to improve my speaking skills uh, for lots of people. It's also um, uh, opportunity to, to not be shy uh, when you speak for about this, uh, this global, top, uh, global topics. your research and also for your answers and uh, I'd like to ask uh, for your personal opinion and for your personal view uh, which ways do you see to overcome the corruption in Ukraine in your personal point of view thank you um, it is a very difficult and interesting question because while uh, the research we also uh, asked these questions uh, for people and they were not really able to answer. Because of course we can say that it is important to have uh, this in, uh, indispensable uh, court system and uh, all of this high um, improvement in uh, education, a lot of work that can be done. Uh, but I personally uh, believe that what we can do is just start from ourselves and our uh, society and to um, pay attention to some things that we um, that we understand as just regular. For example, uh, giving to teachers some, uh, I don't know, um, sweets or something, giving a uh, pain in um, hospitals and all of these things that, that we consider as traditions sometimes can be, um, it's, 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 it's not okay. Yeah. So paying attention. No, ja widzę zmianę taki w szkołach, żeby było bardziej kółek takich zainteresowań i teraz przepraszam. I żeby po prostu przychodzili ludzie z różnych zawodów i omawiali o swojej profesji negatywne strony i jak pozytywne. So Okay. Now? Now? Okay. Um, so, what's the most important thing is that uh, at school there should be more about more interests, cl interests clubs, so um, students can uh, join them, join the teacher who um, maybe share the same interests, and um, he or she can uh, show a way to uh, develop their these interests. But also, uh, what's the second important thing is that um, schools should invite people from different professions and they can tell students um, more about their professions, about, I think, advantages and disadvantages and more about disadvantages because we can see that, um, okay, you have some profession. I can't say what you are doing, but what's the point of your job? What is what you what you really like and what you really don't like in your job? So, um, just I think young people just want to know um, more about what what can oh, I'm sorry what can they uh, what can do what they can do okay what can they do and um, how to how to achieve it also. And uh, to add something to this topic, because I uh, we also have this mix, had this mix uh, during work. Uh, I personally feel this pressure uh, after the the graduate class because you have to pass your exams and you cannot really concentrate on something you you want, but you have uh, the responsibility and you have to answer uh, the expectations of your parents, of teachers, and the society. And it also um, makes you uh, to. To, to choose something that you don't really like, but you, but it is a trend now, maybe. So 
of expression. And uh, one more thing about job. Uh, when I was in Ukraine, uh, I didn't know uh, what I will do in the future. And I think it's also an um, important problem uh, because uh, a lot of people, lots of uh, uh, students in Ukraine don't know after, the, uh, after they finish school, they don't know what they will do uh, in, in their life. Uh, they don't know uh, the job, uh, what, uh, which they will uh, work. And um, in, in Poland, uh, we have more years in Lyceum, in school uh, and university to decide our job, uh, our um, hobby. Um, in Ukraine, it's only 11 years. Uh, in Poland, it's uh, 15, maybe? 15, 16 years. So we have more time to decide uh, our future. Thank you so very much. We have prepared... I would like to uh, invite all participants uh, of our project. Yeah, you are welcome here. <laughs> Students and class teacher, as well from uh, Limanovsky High School in Warsaw, and Grażyna, our academic support. Uh, congratulations and thank you for common time and for common work. Yes, and we are very impressed with the topic you chose independently of, you know, adult guidance. It is really precious to have young people voices and uh, the UNESCO chair that deals with young people, uh, youth researchers, uh, the chair based in Pennsylvania University, uh, prepared special certificates for your participation in the project that we would like to give to you now. I don't know, Eva, if you would like to announce them and I will hand them over, maybe? It will be quicker. Thank you so much. Congratulations on your wonderful project. Uh, we are sure that you will do well in the future. Um, and we want to wish you all the best with your exams, because your exams are coming, we hear. You're studying very hard, so we'll keep our fingers crossed for good luck. And now I invite everybody for lunch. You need a lunch ticket. Um, that, we met, that I made by hand, so <laughs> apologies, but uh, it's because we had to prepare for lunches in our bar called uh, Filmowe, and we'll be heading there in a minute. Um, uh, we can go through the patio or through the cellar, uh, but so it's easiest if you follow us because it's in building C on first floor, Bar Filmowe. So I will be standing here and handing the coupons. Uh, you can choose uh, a salad or a wrap, or you can have a soup and second course, or pasta, or whatever you want for the voucher, and there'll be soft drinks on the side for us as well. Thank you so much, and thank you for being here with us. Thank you. Mm -hmm.